This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you in part by The Strenuous Life. The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you put into action all the things we've been talking about, writing about on AOM for the past 12 years. We've done that in a few ways. First, we've got 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. We've got weekly challenges. We're going to put you outside of your comfort zone and accountability for your physical fitness, doing a good deed, thinking outside of yourself, as well as you'll be a part of a membership of like-minded individuals who are all pushing themselves to become better and more useful. Head over to strenuouslife.co. Find out more information, what's involved, what you get, and make sure you get your email on our waiting list so you'll be one of the first to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, hope to see you there. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. While the divorce rate has fallen over the last several decades, plenty of couples still don't pass the test of time. Fortunately, the odds as to whether or not you divorce are not a matter of pure chance, but something you can improve with intentionality. My guest has some research back advice on how. His name is Scott Stanley. He's a professor of psychology at the University of Denver and the co-author of the book, Fighting for Your Marriage. We last had Scott on the show to talk about the problem with ambiguity in relationships, and that was episode number 349, if you want to check that out. Today, we begin our conversation discussing how marriage issues have changed since you originally published Fighting for Your Marriage in 1994 and the state of American marriage in the 21st century. Scott then shares the biggest issues he sees pop up in marriages over and over again, such as escalating arguments and avoiding conflict. We then discuss communication skills you can use to diffuse these common marital conflicts, including uncovering hidden issues and establishing ground rules for arguments. Scott then makes the case that in addition to mitigating conflict, happy couples need to focus on creating positive encounters with one another, and we end our conversation discussing how to grow in your commitment to your marriage. After the show's over, check out our show notes at aom.is slash fighting for marriage. Scott joins me now via Skype. All right, Scott Stanley, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks. I'm really, really glad to be back. So the last time we had you on, we talked about uh, a bit of, or a lot about your concept of sliding versus deciding. And we'll talk about that as well today. But I want to go um, even broader and even more in depth in some of the re- research and work you've done with, with marriage. You have this great book out. Uh, it's called Fighting for Your Marriage. The original edition was published in 1994. It's been updated a few times. And this book is based on a marriage prep program called PrEP. So what is PrEP? How did it get started? And what kind of issues are you trying to address with it? So PrEP is a a program that my uh, colleague, Howard Markman, really started, founded uh, around 1980. He and I have been working together since then on improving and refining it. And it started out as a a, a program for couples to use premaritally and for organizations to use with couples. And it's become Much more than that, we started focusing just on married couples and any couples actually decades ago. So it's much broader now. PREP stands for the Prevention and Relationship Education Program. And one of its distinctive features is it's based on uh, over 40 years of research on marriage and relationships about what happens in relationships, how people kind of mess things up, what people can do to give themselves a a better chance to really strengthen their relationship and strengthen their marriage. And and we've had a really good run at it. So that that's a bit about prep. And and the book is sort of like the heart of the things that we teach in prep. Uh, One other thing about prep, it's it's a program that a lot of people use in communities in terms of workshops for people to come to to strengthen their marriages, to strengthen their relationships. So we do a lot of different things, but but our real distinction is that it's a evidence based program to help couples do better in marriage. And so, as like I said in the beginning, like this was originally published in 1994. Has anything changed with marriage since you published the original edition? Well, you know, it's it's funny the, the, just to think about that question because a gazillion things have changed about marriage. There's, there's the broader sort of context of society and all the kinds of changes. Uh, we can come back to that in a minute. But in, in some ways, One of the biggest changes that's relevant to the book and the kinds of things that we talk about and that makes our work in some ways even more pertinent than it was when we started is marriage now, while it still has a certain definition and people kind of have a sense of what they expect from marriage or what marriage is, you know, there's a a clear sense that people believe that they're making a, a commitment for life and that's what most people want. But 
Other than that, there's many things that have changed about expectations within marriage and beliefs about marriage and beliefs about relationships. And one of the things that that's done is it's moved marriage from something where people just kind of, well, you got married and you had a script and you had a sense, well, this is what we do. This is what everybody does in marriage to now. There's so many things that are up in the air other than the broad framework of what it means to be committed for the long term that it's moved to what we think of now as sort of a negotiation based relationship where if, if people are smart about it anyway, they have to actually talk through what they are each thinking it means, what they want in their relationship, work through expectations, because you just can't trust anymore that everybody's on exactly the same page. And that puts a lot more pressure on the ability of couples to talk well, talk clearly, talk safely, and talk openly. And I guess the, the big issue that pops up with all these, with this negotiation-based marriage is people have these factors they're negotiating in a marriage, but they are on that old script that, oh, you know, we're in a marriage, we're in it for the commitment in the long haul, but then there's sort of that unspoken friction that pops up. Yeah, and some some of the unspoken frictions are about you know, expectations that people haven't really talked through or haven't really clarified. This happens to a lot of people. You know, you're thinking you're modern. You're thinking you're not going to do things the way your parents did. You're thinking you're like the new generation. Uh, and the fact is, it's really easy for us to like settle right into what we grew up with. And that may or may not have been with parents that were happily married or successfully married or that handled things well. And even for those that grew up with parents that were really stable and sort of happy, there still may be things about how they did things that isn't what's going to work in your relationship. And that's the default if you don't really talk things through and figure it out. So what's this, what does the research say about the state of marriage in America today? Well, there's a lot of things that have changed. One is that divorce rates actually come down quite a bit. But part of why it's come down is that the marriage rate has come down. And as the marriage rate has come down, part of that is people marrying later and later. And I'll come to that in a minute. But part of what that means, part of what's going on with the marriage rate coming down is that some of the people historically that would have married that maybe were at higher risk are not marrying now. And that's some of why the divorce rate is down. And part of what is a giant change culturally is marriage is increasingly becoming something that mostly is reliably done by college graduates, but is less and less done by working class and way less done by those in poverty. One of the other changes is, of course, cohabitation is very common, and it's uh, for many, it's become sort of more part of dating, even for a, a short while, a few decades ago, it kind of was, was a prelude to marriage. Um, but for others, it's become a replacement for marriage, so that's a big change. But I think one of the biggest changes of all is that we've moved to a place where People now expect more than ever in a mate. I and my colleagues and others I know have talked for a long time about the idea of people sort of looking for their soulmate and looking for this sort of perfect partner who will perfectly accept and support them. So there's a, there's a lot of pressure to that. And the other change that comes right along that is, is marriage for many has moved from sort of being the cornerstone that you build your life on to kind of like a capstone. You do it after you've like achieved, you've, you've, you've gotten your job going, your education's all set. And, and these are some pretty giant changes, but I think the biggest one is just expecting so much now that there's pretty much pressure now on a marriage to kind of be perfect or a partner to be sort of perfect. Do sociologists, have they figured out or tried, do they have any ideas of why we put this pressure on marriage? I, there's a lot of different theories. Uh, one person that talks about it a lot in his uh, recent book, I think came out last year, the year before, Eli Finkel in the All or Nothing Marriage talks about this. Andrew Churlin talked a lot about this in terms of this idea of it being sort of a capstone. I think in, in general, and that my favorite idea about what's gone on is that we've moved to a place where the society is, you know, our society is more and more focused on self. It's more and more focused on us being a consumer and, and sort of finding the perfect good and replacing things routinely if they're not perfect or they haven't stayed up. I just got a new iPhone. You know, lots of people, have, you know, we're used to now sort of this replacement cycle and the sense that you should really 
be able to kind of get everything your way and that you should be sort of completely self-actualized in your marriage so that, you know, it should be possible to find the perfect mate. There's a another angle to this that, that I talk about. A lot of people talk about those themes. I think partly people are looking for the perfect mate or looking for their soulmate, the one that would never reject them and accept them and everything, partly because the way we went through a divorce revolution through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then really an increasing number of people just sort of not getting married, people got used to and sort of freaked out by a lot of instability about marriage and about family. And I think that partly led to people Marrying later and later is as a way of self-insuring, you know, I'm going to get my whole life together as an individual before I would join my life with another. And then the other piece that drops in is I think people kind of had this naive belief that if I can find the perfect partner, the exact perfect person on the planet for me, my marriage is going to work. That's the ultimate insurance is I'm going to find the perfect person and I'm just not going to pull the trigger until I find that perfect person for me. So marriages, marriage rate is down, which has led to a decrease in divorce rate. And that has implications. We've had um, Brad Wilcox on the podcast discuss yes. some of those bigger issues of you know the problems that might come up when you have fewer people getting married. But let's talk about the people who are getting married. What problems do you see the most often with couples who are married? So I think there's there's two kinds of things that are there's things that people argue about. So that that list is pretty common and it actually shares a lot with the list that people give for reasons for divorce. It's things like, well, for married people, it's you know, communication, children, hassles about children is you know always pretty but usually pretty high on the list. Expectations, in-laws, you know, those are sort of the money, you know, the, all these are things that people have commonly argued about over the years. But in terms of how relationships actually come apart, I think there's two dominant things, two things that are intertwined that are part of the story for marriages that are struggling. One is kind of a neglect and a loss of positive connection over time, sort of letting that go, not nurturing it, not protecting it. And the other is not handling issues well, not handling stuff that comes up well, so that there's kind of this chronic uh, undercurrent of conflict and negativity and being on edge that just sort of erodes the sense that I can really be what I want most, which is to be comfortable and relaxed with you and that you can be my best friend in life and I'll be your best friend. So people are, everybody's struggling in, with one of those two things and some marriages are really suffering by both of those two, uh, neglecting the positive time together or just not handling issues well together in a way that erodes the positive connection. So before we get into the specific tactics that can improve your marriage, let's talk about the overarching principles of prep. And you have five of them. What are those? Yeah, there's, there's, we started talking about keys to really making a, keeping a relationship strong maybe about 15 years ago. And, and, I, and I love these. And I'll just, for the moment, I'm just going to highlight three of these for, for what we're sure. talking about today because these are the three we focus on most. One is decide, don't slide. Now, the concept of sliding actually comes from a lot of the research that Galena Rhodes and I have done on cohabitation that we've written a lot about. People can find a lot about that on the web, where one of the problems that couples get into is they, they slide into that too easily, and then they've made it harder to break up. But it's also, it's a, it's a great mnemonic, it's a, it's a great idea, decide, don't slide, for just all kinds of things that affect our relationships. For example, if if I'm kind of worn out when I get home tonight and my wife is like fried from something that happened today and, and we're seeing each other later today and something like sets us off, it'd be really easy to like slide into a conflict or slide into like talking about some problem that we have to solve right then when that may not be the good time to do it. That may be like a really bad moment to even try to have that conversation. So decide 
versus sliding. Deciding instead of sliding can be like about the everyday minor things, about getting drawn into stuff at the wrong time. And it can also be about how you make decisions in your relationship and whether you tend to like just sort of slide into something happening versus let's sit down, let's make a good decision about it so we both know what we're doing. So that's one key. A second one is really to the individual and it's do your part. A lot of times people get upset in their marriage and and right, rightfully so. I mean, you know, this person's important. The relationship's important. It has a lot of effect on us day to day. Uh, but the first thing that we tend to reach for all of us is we tend to think about what can I do to get my partner to shape up? How can I change my partner's behavior? How can I get her to handle this different, do this different, be different in this way? Whatever it is, we think about them changing more than we think about us changing. And I know it's a cliche, but some cliches are powerful because they're right that the thing we have the most control over changing is ourselves. So at any given moment, every given day, we want people to be thinking about, well, what's your part? What can you do right now to make the relationship better, to keep it strong, to stay on track, not be so focused on what your partner should be doing differently? Third key, and this is really the the central aspect of a lot of what we get to saying about communication and how people handle conflict, make it safe to connect. I can't even say enough about that. The, The secret of a really great relationship isn't that your partner's perfect and it isn't that you're perfect. It's that you're good friends and you have emotional safety. You you have the ability to talk about anything you need to talk about, to share, and most importantly, to kind of be yourselves, that you don't have to be perfect with each other. You you can talk about things that you're concerned about or the things you're struggling with, and it's safe to connect around all the good stuff and around some of the stuff that's not so good in life because the two of you are handling things in such a way that you both know that it's safe to be closer, it's safe to draw closer instead of push each other away. And on any given day, I think we can each be mindful of things we can do as individuals that can make it safer to connect with my partner and make it safer for her to connect with me. Okay, so decide, don't slide, do your part, and make it safe, make connection safe. That's right. If people actually write those things down, if they if they try to be more mindful of those three things, any given day, any given week, any given month, and they act on one of those today or tomorrow, their marriage is going to be stronger. So a lot of prep is dedicated to helping, helping couples handle conflict more effectively, communicate more effectively. But before we talk about what ideal marital communication look like, let's talk about the common destructive communication patterns you see pop up that people slide into, right? So what are the most common ones you see over and over again with couples? Well, the big one, the one that we we always talk about, there's, there's four we talk a lot about, but the one that I think people most, well, everybody relates to all these actually, but the big one is escalation. And there's a number of ways you can define it. But pretty simply, the idea is something little all of a sudden is led to us having this really negative, nasty, perhaps intense conflict argument discussion that isn't going well, where things are getting heated. So, so escalation would be sort of on the content. You know, we started out talking about this tiny little thing, and one of my, one of my favorite videos that we've had of all time that we show around the danger signs in our workshops uh, and the workshops that people do based on prep. This couple's having this blowout. I mean, just this, this real meltdown. And we were fortunate to capture on the video that the guy sort of, as this is going on, makes an unbelievable observation. He says, what's going on here? We started out talking about cleaning the house and now we're talking about leaving, me leaving. I mean, it had escalated from something about chores, about something about 
not happening right about expectations or responsibilities in the house to talking about the whole relationship ending. So sometimes it's the content that is escalated way beyond where it started, even to the point of threatening the relationship, or it's just the emotional intensity has really ramped up because something right now triggered this argument. And why does escalation occur? I mean, so how do you go from talking about chores to you know, having to define the relationship conversation? Well, I think what happens is uh, one of our favorite models, and I think one of the best things we write about is issues and events model that we talk about. And, and the idea is that as we move along through life, we move in along on the surface of our relationship. But under the surface for all of us in any of our relationships, any and, and especially the most important ones like marriage, there's a set of issues. And, and my wife and I, we have a set of issues. Uh, different couples going to have another set of issues that the sort of the chronic things that are the underlying problems that we struggle with or that kind of keep coming around in the relationship. And, you know, we could all work more on sort of solving some of those issues, but some of them are just sort of part of the package that, you know, these are the things that we struggle on. And the common things on that level are like money and communication and sex and in-laws and children and chores and, you know, but different ones are more important in, in different ways for different couples. On the surface of the relationship, though, we're just walking along and there's what we call events. So events can trigger issues. So so let's say, this is common for many couples, money is something we struggle a lot with. Or let's, the example I gave before, escalation or uh, chores, you know, responsibilities around the house is one of our common issues. Well, before that argument that day for them, something happened around chores. I mean, something came up right then that triggered that that issue that's just under the surface and they haven't resolved it, they haven't learned how to talk about it well, and all the fury and all the energy of that issue that's just under the surface comes exploding through that event that's triggered it right now. So what we're going to try to do as a couple, which is a bad thing, is we're going to talk about it right now. We're not going to talk about it well. It's going to be an argument. It's going to be nasty because the trigger and the issue chose the time. We we didn't choose the time. So here, the, it's like a minefield. And so, and that's one of the consequences for couples of this having a lot of things that routinely sort of trigger them into escalating conflicts is they feel like they're walking in a minefield and they just can't relax. So, so those are the things that trigger escalation. There's little events that happen and we have all these issues that are just waiting to be sort of exploding through the surface of our relationship because they're things that we haven't been able to deal with effectively. And some of those issues that can be triggered by an event can be hidden. Like the couple doesn't really know what the issue is. I mean, example with the, the chores, let's say the husband doesn't want to mow the lawn. Like he wants to like outsource that. Yeah. But like the wife, they get an argument and it's not about outsourcing or pain. It's like, it's more like the wife had an expectation. Well, my dad mowed the yard. Like you should mow the yard too, because it shows you're a good dad and a good husband. That could be the issue that triggered, or that could be the event that triggered that issue. Yeah. And, and let's just add to that. So, uh, and one of the things about hidden issues, the, the way we like to talk about them, they don't even have to be, they could be subconscious. They, you know, there's probably a lot of times that they are, but more often they're kind of unexamined and, or they're un connected, that it's maybe obvious once somebody slows down and starts thinking about, well, where did the fury of that come from? And and so this is a great example. I'm glad you came back to it in that way. Suppose, for example, like you said, that that he hadn't, maybe that's on his list. That's one of the things he's supposed to do, which is mow the lawn or do something in terms of house cleaning in particular within the house. It's sort of, maybe the toilets are his responsibility. I don't, you know, whatever it is. But maybe let's add to that in terms of the hidden issue level, because that's the issue level. That's like the chores and have we clarified who's doing what and are we each doing our part to be responsible. But now suppose not only did her father maybe used to do those things, but somehow she had encoded that deeply as that's a sign of his commitment to to our family, to mom. You know, it really meant a lot. She noticed that she saw it. So now what's 
adding to this escalation for them might be not just that it's annoying that he didn't do this or that I thought we agreed on this and he might think we agreed on that. But now it's got this much bigger thing to it for her about the meaning of it related to the, does that mean he's not so committed? And notice his comment because what he does, when I say he, he says, you know, we talked about, started about talking about cleaning the house to talking about me leaving. He's actually also noticing their commitment came up in another huge way in terms of a hidden issue in this fight, because now the whole future of the relationship is on the table. And it sounds like maybe if you typed it out, it sounds like we're talking about house cleaning, but you can really tell what the conversation has shifted to is a big, ugly, nasty argument about commitment in our relationship. And that's going to take a lot of effort to wind down now and get control of. And that that's like a particularly strong and, and negative form of escalation when so much is involved with so much meaning. The Strenuous Life is an online platform that we created to help you turn your intentions into actions. We've done that in a few ways. We first, we created a series of 50 different badges based around 50 different skills. There's hard skills like self-defense, wilderness survival, outdoor skills, soft skills like public speaking, social skills, personal finance, how to be a better husband, better father. We also provide accountability for you for your physical activity every day, doing a good deed so you're starting to think outside of yourself and thinking about something bigger. And then we also provide weekly challenges. They're going to put you outside of your comfort zone physically, intellectually, socially, and besides Besides the uh, weekly challenges and the, the daily check-ins and the badges, TSL Platform also provides a way for you to get together with other TSL members in your area so you can meet up in actual physical space and start doing stuff together. And the guys, the meetups are, it's a ground up thing. They're organizing it themselves. Some events are really simple just to get together for a ruck for an hour, but then other groups are planning these multi-day events where they're doing all sorts of stuff, camping outside and working on TSL stuff together. So it's a real community that's been formed here. If you'd like to get in our next enrollment, head over to strenuouslife.co. You can see everything that's involved with the Strenuous Life and then make sure you get your email on our waiting list. That will help you be the first one to know when enrollment opens up. Strenuouslife.co, check it out and make sure to get your email on our waiting list. And I hope to see you in one of our next enrollments for the Strenuous Life. Life. All right, so that's escalation. Another common negative communication pattern you talk about that I was that I thought was interesting was negative interpretation. Yeah, this is actually one of my favorites. If I can have favorites of, of negative patterns for couples, because it's it's a little more subtle, it's a little less obvious. And the basic idea is that we all have beliefs that are wrong about our relationship. And we also have beliefs in any given moment that might be wrong, where we've sort of taken a more negative interpretation of our partner's behavior, what they were meaning, why they did what they did, what it's about. And you can see that that's all over the example we just talked about, right? That that, that could be part of what's going on for that couple. And, and the fact is that when we react to our partners, especially when there's conflict and things are not going well, we're not just reacting to exactly what they said. And we're certainly not necessarily reacting to what they really meant if everything was calm and said just right. We're reacting to our interpretation of it. Another favorite example of mine is from another couple we have on video, but this couple's having an argument. We didn't film them in the car, but but we know how the argument went in the car. So imagine they're driving down the street. He's driving, it's pretty classic in that, you know, he's the one behind the wheel and he changes lanes in a way that feels abrupt and not safe to her. And so back to the issues and events model, that's an event. So driving, he moves over, maybe he sort of gets into somebody else's lane kind of abruptly. Let's suppose that his driving is kind of a chronic issue for her, so or for for them. And here we go. You know, that's the event. It triggers this, but in the heat of the the argument that they're now going to have because this event has triggered this this argument, she says as they're arguing about it, she says, "Well, you don't care about our safety." Now the question is. Is that actually likely? Does he actually not care about the safety of her or the safety of their child? It's not really likely. I mean, you can find people in the world and somebody that's listening to this right now is married to somebody who's truly unsafe and doesn't care about their safety. But that's not likely actually a true statement for her to really believe about him. 
In the heat of the moment, as they're arguing, he says, well, you just want to yell at me. Well, how likely is it that she just thinks, well, it'd be nice if we could just take a drive because I really, I want, I want some time to really yell at him today. I haven't had a good yelling time at him. So I just, you know, what could I say today that would light him up so I could yell at him? But they're reacting, they're each reacting, and they each say this, they each say that negative belief in the heat of the argument, which shows what the idea is behind the argument for both of them. You don't care about our safety. You just want to yell at me. And both those beliefs are just wrong. Now, partly their struggle at that moment is that they're, they're, you know, they're sideways and they have to like calm things down. They have to learn to take a time out, which is something that we teach a lot about. But there's a general principle here that I, I like people to struggle with, which is this, that when we're really continually frustrated with our partners about something, it might be that their behavior is actually really a legitimate, reasonable problem that we should be able to talk about and express. But it may also be that we have an interpretation of what they're doing that's unfair and not very reasonable. And here's where the challenge comes in. My partner, if I have a negative belief about my wife that's pretty deep or it's one that affects us daily, she can't do a darn thing to change it. She can't do anything to change it because humans are amazingly good at seeing what they expect to see and disregarding all the evidence of anything else. So if there's a chronic issue of sort of negative interpretation in our relationship, the only way it can change is I have to be willing as an individual to ask myself, is, are there some beliefs about my mate that I have that I'm willing to think about? Well, they're not only negative, but they might be unfair. And am I willing to push myself to look for evidence that's contrary to that? That's one of the ways to battle negative interpretations. And it sounds like negative interpretations contributes to escalation, right? So like, say there's an issue that pops up, like uh, husband doesn't mow the yard, Right. That's an issue. Yes. But the wife can think yep. the wife can, you know, have a negative interpretation that's like, well, he just doesn't care about the family and he's not committed. Yep. And that just leads he's to escalation. He's disrespecting me. He's whatever. Yes, I think as I think negative interpretations are a big part of a lot of escalation. Now sometimes escalation doesn't have to have that. It's just purely frustrating and annoying and there's nothing so much behind it. And other times you can you can like slow it down and and think about, well, what was I actually reacting to that got us so sideways? And you might find a negative interpretation once you allow yourself to just sit back and think it through. And I, I imagine one of the hard things about overcoming negative interpretations is that especially if you've been married for a long time, you think you know your spouse really well. And so you think you know what they're thinking. Even though, you know, you might have been together 20 years, you don't know what they're thinking. Yeah, and I think what's important about that is yeah, you might have actually had an unfair interpretation of what they tend to think or do about X Y or Z this whole time. And and but you've never examined it. And that's a, it'd be a great place for the do your part kind of, key. you know, think about well, one of my one of my parts in this relationship is to actually push myself to think about where maybe I'm being unfair and how I view something that I've resented or that I've been concerned about. And, and maybe my partner doesn't have the motivation that I think we could talk about that. We could talk about it openly if we can talk safely. That's an important thing for couples to learn how to do. But I can also push myself to really maybe think differently. Maybe I've had this wrong or maybe I've had it right, but part of my negative interpretation is they should be able to easily change it. Might not be that they can easily change that. So, so now you got some challenges within yourself about how you want your marriage to go. So a common response or negative response to conflict, and like as you said, you know, conflict is going to happen in a marriage. It's normal, but the way you respond to it is what is a big deciding factor whether your marriage is healthy or not. But a, a negative response is what you call withdrawal and avoidance. What does that look like in a relationship? So this is a dance everybody tends to understand pretty well in their relationship. I, I'm sure there's some relationships where there's virtually none of this, but it's it's a minority of relationships. The idea is that in many relationships, when there is an issue, it may not even have escalated, but it's just, you know, somebody's aware there's an issue, there's a problem, there's something to be dealt with or talked about or whatever. 
many couples can identify with the idea that one tends to be more the pursuer and the other tends to be the withdrawer. Now, we can say classically, it does you know, if you had to bet without knowing anything about a couple where there's a, you know, husband and wife, who tends to withdraw more? Yeah, you're going to win more often if you bet that he's the one that pulls away. But it's not so simple in that regard because there's some really good research done by Andy Christian and, uh, Christensen and colleagues at UCLA where they showed that who tends to withdraw isn't – it's somewhat – it's related to some gender typical sort of dances that couples do in terms of men pulling away and women, you know, we need to talk, you know, we need to talk, come and talk to me about this or her pursuing him, you know, around the house to talk. But what they found out is partly who pursues is related to who wants some resolution on something. So it may be, it may be that women are more comfortable talking or feel more responsible on average to like bring things up. But it may also be that women on average want more change in relationships. That's not exactly a, a shocking thought for most people that are that are married. But the one thing to keep in mind there is it doesn't matter so much whether it's the male or the female who tends to withdraw, there's a lot of men that tend to be the pursuer with the female being the withdrawer. Maybe even about one third of the time, it tends to go more that way. But the thing we like to highlight about that is it almost doesn't matter so much who tends to be the pursuer and who tends to be the withdrawer. The important thing is to get out of that dynamic because it's it's one of the well, it's why we call it a communication danger sign. It's one of the hallmarks of a relationship that's not going to do well in life. And it also has negative interpretations that are partly at the heart of it. Because at, when a couple gets really strongly into this dance where one's really pushing and the other's really pulling away, it's very easy for the pursuer to think that the withdrawer doesn't care about the relationship. And it's very easy for the withdrawer to think that the pursuer just wants to stir conflict up or control them or whatever. And the much better interpretations there, here's, here's just a couple examples. We think a lot of withdrawers, some of them, yeah, they're just less committed and they're just putting their partner off and they're not going to deal with stuff. That happens. We think much more often if you got a partner that withdraws from you and doesn't want to talk with you, it might be because they associate talking with fighting. And that they know that when we start talking about that or talk about any one of these things, it doesn't go so well and we end up having a big, nasty conflict. And what they may be trying to avoid is not you, but fighting with you. And that's not a bad thing. It's just you have to learn to do something different. And and same with the other side. The the withdrawer could could really think more generously about the pursuer that, well, it's not a bad thing to want to deal with stuff and try to deal with stuff right now instead of waiting for an event to trigger it. Uh, So partly it's a battle of changing how we think about it. And then the real battle then as a couple is learning to talk more safely and openly at times when you really need to. And let's talk about what couples can do to be able to have this safe communication. So you don't have these negative communication patterns of escalation, pursue withdrawal. And you talk about in the book that one thing a couple can do that can go a long way to help having productive communication about their marital conflicts is to establish some ground rules. And that can be different for every couple, but what are some ones that you found useful with your work in prep? So let's let's talk about three ground rules that I think are really important for couples to think about in the relationship. One's a little more technical, but I'll I'll give people the idea and we can tell them where they can see a video if they want. Uh, But the first one, and I think the fundamental one, you can see how important it is from everything we've been talking about, is agree to take a time out when things are escalating, when things are not going well. Now, time out is one of the simplest things that we have taught forever in our materials. And I like to say to couples, you know what? We mean simple conceptually. We don't mean that simple always means really easy to do. Because the whole idea of a timeout is it's something you have to do together when things are escalating, when nothing good is going to come from what's happening right now. You have to have a way to put the brakes on it because you're not going to convert it 
usually to a great discussion right then. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times you'd just be better to have an agreed upon way to put the brakes on. And I like to tell couples, look, think about this. This is not a timeout where like you say to your three-year-old, you need to take a timeout. There's the corner, you know, get to it. Think about a sports team. When they take a timeout, they're not putting each other in timeout. They're taking a timeout as a team to get their game together. They're, you know, if you think about the NBA, you know, here's a game and the other team's just like running up the score on you. It's time to take a timeout and get your act together as a team and figure out what you're going to do to stop what's going on right now that you've lost control of. That's the best way. The key to this are a couple of things that two people can talk about and negotiate, agree upon the signal, which could be verbal, could be the words timeout, could be the, you know, the hand signal for timeout, could be any other word they want to use, but they both have to agree. When one of us says that, it doesn't mean the other's blowing me off or that it's withdrawal. It means that's the signal that we agreed to chill to stop, to put the brakes on, to each do the best we can at, our, at that moment to do our part to, to rein that in. And then the other thing is to agree that after we've calmed down, maybe in a day or so, they can work this out. They can decide to, you know, come back together in a couple hours or the next evening, or, you know, they can make that a, a key part of the decision that you'll come back and talk about what needs to be talked about from what happened. If something does need to be talked about, uh, they'll come back and talk about it later when they can talk better and things have calmed down. Another ground rule that we recommend, and this, this gets to a whole communication technique that, that we recommend for people. Uh, and I'll just describe it really briefly is to to use a more to use what we call the speaker listener technique uh, we teach a, a particularly structured way to communicate better and it's not the way people would communicate most of the time it's a way to try to communicate better when you either know it's a really important conversation or you know we need uh, to kind of chill and bring more structure to it right now and what we encourage people to do when they're using the speaker listener technique is to actually sit down, pick an object that they both agree is what they're gonna call the floor. Could be a pen, could be a piece of paper, could be our book, could be whatever they want it to be. But basically the idea is that you're gonna have a conversation where you make it really clear at any given moment who's the speaker and who's the listener. The floor can go back and forth. In fact, it should go back and forth a lot. But let's say I start with the floor. I've got that object. I'm going to say a bit, not a ton. I'm not going to give a, you know, like a whole speech. I'm going to say a bit and stop. And what the listener's going to do is just tell me what they heard me say, you know, just feed it back. Okay, so you're really frustrated about blah, blah, blah. And then I'll say a little bit more. I'm still holding the floor through all of this because the floor says, you know, who's the speaker, who's the listener. And then she paraphrases some more. Maybe I say a little bit more. She paraphrases. And I'm going to pass the floor. It's her turn. Now she's going to say something. I'm going to tell her what I hear her saying. I'm going to be listening carefully. I'm going to try to tell her what I hear her saying. I'm paying attention. My message is off the table now because she's got the floor. What the floor is doing is it's sort of like telling both of us whose radio station our couple radio is tuned to right now. So right now she's got it. And that floor can go back and forth lots of times in a good conversation. And people will say, well, that's so artificial. Yeah, it is. It actually is pretty, it it gets way less artificial if people practice it. But I like to say back to people, well, tell me what you naturally do. You don't like artificial? Okay, great. (laughs) Tell me what you naturally do. And what a lot of people naturally do sounds a whole lot like the danger signs. So this is, it's a structured way to bring a little bit of order to a conversation when you really need to do a good job and make it safe to connect. People can find out more about that. We we have a video on uh, YouTube about the speaker listener technique. If they just look for the prep channel and look, look for that, uh, we have a nice 17 minute video there that does a great job of teaching that. One more ground rule I, I, I want to highlight, Brett, because it, it really gets to the positive side. And I, I, in some ways, I think this could be the one of the most powerful things that we say to people because it's simple and basic. Make the time for the positive things like fun, friendship, sensual connection, whatever kinds of other ways we connect. Make the time and protect those times from issues and conflict. Uh, 
So people are often not making the time anymore. And then when they finally do have time, like they're going out or they're just taking a walk or they're kind of in relaxed mode together. So they let things come up. They let things come up during that time that starts to trigger the, the tough stuff. And away they go and they've trashed that sense of uh, like peace and safety and time just to be connected. So these are, these are great. And it seems like the first two are first ground rules you establish are geared towards preventing or reducing those negative encounters with a couple. And that last one is there to, or I mean, also that last one is there is also to prevent, it's sort of, it's, you're playing defense a bit. Yes. Uh, yeah. And it's and, offense and defense. Yeah. You're exactly right. That last one it's bringing in one and two because it's like if you're getting good at one and two, you're going to be good at three. You're going to have a better chance. Uh, you think about this. A couple's uh, going out. Uh, by the way, it doesn't have to be going out on a date. That's just like an easy example. I think a lot of people have just really great time like walking around the block or, you know, are, are doing something together on a you know project. Whatever it is, it's the time where they feel most safe together and relaxed and as friends. But then one thinks, oh, you know, right, uh, we're going to have to deal with that visa bill. And <laughs> like time out right there, like just get that back out of that time. You put that in a different time where you're controlling things, you're deciding this is a good time to deal with things and have times in your relationship where all that kind of stuff's just off limits and you can relax. Yeah, don't kill the mood. Yes. So this goes to this idea of research from John Gottman about you know, the, this sort of ratio for a healthy relationship, this yeah. idea of five to one. So that you know that for every one negative interaction you have with your partner, you have to have five positive feelings sort of keep that balance and this is like rough i mean it's sort of you know it's not exact exactly right but this goes to this point if you just spending your time on trying to reduce or eliminate those those negative encounters with your spouse can go a long way to improving the quality of your relationship because that one single encounter can just it can do a lot of damage so exactly right you know and if we're routinely having those sort of negatives and you know a lot of the negatives are like just they're, they're like little hits and i, I don't even mean <clears throat> you know violence i mean they're a little like ouch you know you just said that or you knew that would dig or or, or i think you knew that that would dig those little things the the negative stuff you know whether it's five to one or 20 to one or whatever the the idea is we are so reactive to the negative. It's so salient for us. And it, it really puts us in a hole. And you can think about it as like deposits and the negatives. If, if you're writing checks all the time that you can't cover, your relationship's going to suffer. And the importance of just having that regular making deposits, putting it in the bank for our relationship by having that downtime, that fun time is so crucial. I, I talked earlier about a minefield, and, and it's, a, it's a great metaphor for what's gone so wrong for a lot of people in their marriage, because instead of feeling like I can be more relaxed and let down with you than anybody on the planet, if I have to keep my guard up because we have all these negatives we're not managing, you're the last person I can relax with. That boy, if that's your marriage right now, boy, you, you got to turn that around. You got to reverse that positive and that negative in a, in a big way. So let's talk about playing offense a bit more. And one way you talk about that couples can increase the, those amount of the amount of positive interactions they have is becoming your the friend of your spouse again. Yeah. What is what is that? What is what does a spousal friendship look like? You know, I, I I it can probably look like a lot of different ways. I. uh I think part of why it's so important is it's the number, I think it is the number one thing that people really do reasonably expect to have in their marriage. Uh, and, you know, yeah, it may be, there may be some gender things where, you know, a lot of, it's going to be true that more women than men have, you know, some other female really best friends and stuff. And the male might have sort of a more limited network on average where she is really kind of his best friend. But that's neither here nor there. People really want like, you are my best friend in this regard in life. We're doing life together as friends. And if you think about what friends do, it's pretty different. I mean, I have a, a guy friend that we have lunch every 
uh, about every month. I mean, it, it's just a it's a great long term friendship where, and that's what we like to do. You know, it's, we're not going out hunting or whatever stuff. We we get done. We we get we have lunch together, and we'll we have a reliable routine. We will talk about tech, politics, and then maybe some other personal stuff. What's going on in our lives? But it always we always go through tech and politics, and and that's sort of the nature of our friendship. Uh, my wife and I have a different friendship and different things. But think about back to my friend for a second. We do this uh, about every month. How long would we stay friends if the next time we sat down together, one of us said, you know, I want to talk about something you said last time. You know, you said blah, blah, blah. And I didn't like the way you said that or I didn't like it that you were five minutes. You know, whatever you can sort of imagine, something that's sort of grinchy, something that's sort of more conflicted, something that sort of sounds a little bit more like what marriage can be like for a lot of people. Well, now it's like, this isn't this isn't what I'm looking for in a friend. This isn't what I was looking for. And with your spouse, yeah, you got to deal with that stuff. You got to have it. But what you really want in a friend is to be relaxed, to be able to talk about whatever, to be able to be yourself, say things, and to talk about the kinds of things that friends talk about, which are things that you're interested in, things that are fun, things that you're curious about. That's the stuff friends talk about, not about all the stuff that's conflicts of life. And I imagine a lot of couples, they know what that is because they probably, when they first started their relationship, yes. it was a friendship. And that's yep. what, you know, you, you, when you're dating, you're, you're on the phone talking about life goals, politics, books you've read. But then, yeah, that life stuff, you know, you get married, you have kids, there's bills that can start crowding it out and you, you forget how to be friends. And that's where that make both the making the time part. And the protecting the time from issues and conflict becomes in so important because everything else does conspire to crowd this out. Your kid really does need stuff tonight and needs stuff tomorrow morning. And your work is demanding and you have to get in there and you have to do stuff or you might not have a job. And there's probably more pressure of that sort. Uh, maybe, I don't know if there's more pressure like that than ever, but there's a lot of pressure in a lot of ways. So life does get crowded and we really don't have the time like we used to have which makes it all the more important to make some pockets of time that work for the two of you that are reasonable in the amount of time you have one of the things that my wife and i do pretty often that is like really good friend time is we take like a half hour walk and we'll talk about stuff uh, whatever it can be all kinds of things we'll talk about but that tends to be it's a very relaxed time we never have a conflict or a fight or an issue coming up during that time i think we just sort of both know this is the time for that and we make it happen often enough we could make it happen more often by the way but but that's like that's the quintessential essence of the friend time is having that sort of time where you're connected and you're not working on anything and you're not working on each other. And to have that front time, you have to, going back to that overarching principle, you have to decide not slide. Because like, the easy thing, as you said, talking about you get home from work, yeah. your wife's home, you've been yep. with the kids or she's been at work. The sliding thing would be just like, well, we're just going to like watch Netflix. Yep. And yep. that's it. But you have to, you have to purposely decide, no, we're going to set aside this day, this time. It can be 30 minutes, an hour. We're going to do this thing. Yeah, it's and that it's a per, perfect. I'm glad you you put that in there because you have to actually make that decision where you both understand we're trying to do this. We've decided we've elevated it to something we're not just going to let slide anymore. And does that guarantee perfection in your marriage? No. Does that guarantee that it happens? No, but it sure ups the odds because you've looked each other in the eye and said, "Let's try to make this happen." All right. So we've talked about avoiding conflicts or mitigating them. We've talked about increasing those positive interactions. Another aspect of uh, this prep program is growing commitment in your marriage. What does that look like? And what do you mean by that? So, and you know this from our earlier show, one of the things that I've done a lot of research on and thought a lot about over the years is how commitment works in relationships. And you can break it down into two broad categories. There's kind of the things, uh, what I call constraint commitment, they're the things that sort of keep us together whether or not we want to be together. And that's kind of this, and that's not a bad 
kind of commitment, by the way, but it's more the static side of commitment. It kind of just is. You have a life together and you, you build up constraints and that's normal. And it's actually fairly healthy in some ways, as long as your relationship's healthy. But the other side of commitment is the dynamic side. It's the side where we can make decisions and we can decide and do things differently. And, and there's a couple of things I, I like to focus on related to it. It's what I call dedication. And it's the part of commitment where it's the it's what you can choose. It's I want to, I, I'm going to act on this, I'm going to make this a priority. And, and here's two specific things that people can do to really grow their dedication, maintain their dedication, keep it going, whatever the right uh, way to describe it is for the person that's listening right now. One is, is to protect the priority of the relationship, to make it a priority. We just, we just talked about all kinds of examples about that, making the time. And the thing I want to layer into that, the secret to that for many of us, if you're, if you identify with being a busy person with a lot of things you have to do in life and a lot of requests on your time, you're going to find that the secret to making your relationship a priority is not only making the time for your relationship, but it's getting good at saying no to stuff that's lower on the list. A lot of us have trouble with, we, we say yes to too many things, and the secret to maintaining priority in our relationship is actually saying no, and saying no to the things that are lower on the list. I, the best expression of this ever came from my uh, second son. Before he turned six of our two sons, he's the one that came from the factory sort of more than the other tuned well, let's just say less toward compliance and more toward the word no. So, you know, you'd ask him to do something, say no. Uh, hey, would you go clean up your room? No. You know, and sometimes the no was nonverbal. <laughs> sometimes the no was very verbal. But one day before he was six, I said, why? And I didn't, this is not a good psychologist question, but I was just sort of having some fun with him. I was like, hey, you're, you're always saying no. Why don't you try saying yes? It sounds like this. Yes. Come on. Say yes. Say yes. No, no, no. And so this sort of verbal tickling and we're going back and forth. And I asked him, not looking for any serious response. I said, why do you always say no? And there was no pause. And he said, this, this is the exact sentence. I wrote it down in, in my diary. I keep for both of my sons. He said, because yes, takes too much time. <laughs> it's out of the mouth <laughs> of babes. I love that. Uh, it blew me yeah. away. I like sat down for a moment. And I thought, wow, wow. I was like, that's like profound. The, Cause that's the secret that many of us need to learn. Okay, the other thing about commitment, here's something that people can do, and this, this, will, this will be a nice thing to focus on in terms of uh, what people can take right out of this show and in terms of something they can do this very minute. It relates to the idea that one of the, the hallmarks of being really dedicated in a relationship is, is we tend to feel good about occasionally sacrificing for a partner, doing things that aren't maybe so much what we wanted or what were really sort of best for us. But, you know, I can do this for him. I can do this for her. I can give a little bit here. I can, we can go your way. You know, there's like a give and take. And in a healthy marriage, both have that mindset, both have the give and take, both sacrifice for the other. One of the things I like to challenge people with, though, is, is this thought that relates to sort of deciding and not sliding with regard to some little sacrifices. And it's a task that goes like this. Take out a piece of paper, write down just a few things that you know on any given day or at least any given week you can do. It's very doable. That's easy to do. Doesn't take a lot of time. Doesn't take a lot of effort. And your partner really likes it. You know they like it. You're not like deluding yourself. When I do this little thing, she likes that. When I do this, he likes that. Think about things that fit that list. It's small. It's doable. It's something I can do probably yet today, certainly yet this week. And I know she kind of likes it. And one more thing to define this list. I'm not really likely to do it this week. I'm not likely to do that thing. I can write out the list. I know what's on that list. I know a few things that are definitely on that list. And I'm not really likely to do any of those this week and decide to do that. Do one or two of those this week. 
remind yourself next week. Do one or two of those things next week. I think we all have this list where we know this works. It's totally within my power. It's totally doable, but I'm not likely to do it. And we can nudge ourselves. We can remind ourselves. Do more of that stuff because that's the stuff that's going to make the biggest difference in your marriage day to day. I love it. Well, Scott, there's so much more we could talk about. Where can people go to learn more about the book and the the work you do? So if they want to learn a lot more just about what we do with prep and all the different kinds of things, the best single place they can go is prepinc.com, P-R-E-P-I-N-C.com. And the first thing there, that if they want to actually learn more about the skills and strategies, there's an online program we have there that's the first link they'll see at prepping.com. It's also at a web page called lovetakeslearning.com is our e-prep program. It's an online program uh, for prep, and it's uh, a program they can do in the privacy of their home. They can work through at their own pace. It's inexpensive. I think it's about 25 bucks. It's got very good research on it in terms of getting results, and it will teach a couple of the kinds of things we're talking about today and give them ways and more information on how to avoid the negatives, how to increase the positives, and protect their relationship. Fantastic. Well, Scott Stanley, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Brett. I really appreciate it. Like I say with Scott Stanley, he's the co-author of the book, Fighting for Your Marriage. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. And if you want to find out more information about prep, you can go take the online course at lovetakeslearning.com. And also check out our show notes at aom.is slash fighting for marriage, where you find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. Well, that wraps up another edition of the AOM Podcast. Check out our website at artofmanliness.com where you can find our podcast archives. There's over 500 episodes there, as well as thousands of articles we've written over the years over on relationships, how to be a better husband, better father, personal finance, you name it, we've got it. And if you'd like to enjoy ad-free episodes of the Art of Manliness Podcast, you can do so on Stitcher Premium. Head over to stitcherpremium.com, sign up, use code MANLINESS to get a month free trial. Once you're signed up, download the Stitcher app on Android or iOS and start enjoying new episodes of the Art of Manliness Podcast ad-free. And if you haven't done so, already, I'd appreciate it if you take one minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. It helps that a lot. And if you've done that already, thank you. Please consider sharing the show with a friend or family member who you think will get something out of it. As always, thank you for the continued support. And until next time, this is Brett McKay reminding you not only to listen to the A-Win podcast, but put what you've heard into action. <laughs>